All right. Good evening. I am Kelly Lemon, and I want to welcome everyone to the RVA Community Makers 2022. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be um, here with you all tonight, and we're going to spend the next hour together honoring unique and special, special community makers, um, many of them that I know personally, and I am just so humbled and honored once again to be able to give them the flowers that they deserve. First off, we'd like to introduce Dr. Monroe Harris, president of the Board of Trustees for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. He is going to join us and give us a gracious welcome. Dr. Harris. Kelly, thank you so much. And I might add that you look absolutely beautiful. On behalf of the museum and director Alex Nargis, I would like to say welcome to everyone tuning in this evening. This is one of my most favorite Black History Month celebrations. The RVA Community Makers is a public art initiative that involves local artists, as well as the voice and participation of the community at large every year. I am proud to say that I have welcomed visitors and acknowledged the honorees since year one, four years ago. The Virginia Museum of Fine Arts is delighted to present seven distinguished people this evening. They are all so deserving. While we are gathering virtually tonight to give remarks, the artwork is on view in our atrium at the museum. So please plan to visit. Thank you to Chase for sponsoring this project. Here to give greetings on behalf of Chase is Marquita Hurd, Relationship Executive for Government Banking in the Mid-Atlantic. Hello, Marquita. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, Chase is delighted to present this important community engagement project and to celebrate Black History Month with the BMFA and you. This is the second year that Chase has sponsored this event at the BMFA, and I take pride in working for a firm that is committed to its community. Chase is more than just new branches and jobs in the region. It's more about our communities. When our communities are doing well, we're all doing well. So congratulations to the honorees and back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Marquia, and thank you so much to Chase for sponsoring this great event. Um, we're going to keep this moving um, and make sure um, we leave some, some time, of course, for the community to get involved with questions and answers and things like that at the end. So um, let's turn it over to the people that made this possible. I'd like to introduce Hamilton Glass, artist, mur muralist, and project creator. Hamilton Glass' career as an artist stems from his um, ag agriculture and design background. Despite working in the agriculture field, I mean, excuse me, architecture field for over seven years, his passion for public art pushed him to start a career as an artist. Public art has always been a big inspiration for Hamilton because of its power to influence and inspire the surrounding community. With every opportunity Hamilton has given to create, he's tried to convey a message that connects his art to the community. Using his background in architecture, he creates images that reference architectural drafting practices, which are represented in the sharp lines, scale, and balance of the piece. The bright colors and unpredictable lines and shapes are used to convey energy and movement in each piece. Hamilton's work is just a single canvas, print, or mural. One of the things he enjoys most is creating multi-layer projects that amplify many voices. In 2020, Hamilton founded two large projects, founded two large projects, Mending Walls and All Together, which were created to address the civil unrest and pandemic rage in our country. This was a way for Hamilton to process current events and to share that opportunity for expressions with others throughout art. Hamilton is always looking to use his art as inspiration and heal in a healing tool in the community, as well as being a great example of working of a working black artist. Thank I'd like you, to Kelly. welcome Hamilton to this to the screen. Hey, Ham. Hey, Kelly. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here for another iteration of RVA Community Makers. Yeah, I love all the work that you're doing, and it's just an honor that you are connecting with the biggest art institution in the state of Virginia to do so and carry on a legacy. Thank you, Ham. Yeah. 
Sandra Sellers, photojournalist and sole photographer of this year's project. She's an award-winning photojournalist with the Richmond Free Press and the photographer of the Lewis Draper Archive at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. She's a storyteller. She's searching for adventure and beauty everywhere. And she will share her perspective of how um, she makes a sitter feel at ease. Let's welcome Sandra to the stage. Hello. How you doing? I'm okay. Happy Thank to be you. here. Thank you for all you do in the community. Not a problem. Last but not least, oh, here we go. Paula Sailor Robinson, the Director of Audience Development and Community Engagement is here to provide a brief history of the project and share um, the importance of partnering with the community and how that's important to BMF that. Paula? Hello everyone, how are you? I am delighted that we are all gathered this evening, even if it's just virtually. This is the fourth year that we have done RVA Community Makers. And I'm happy to say that with each year we learn and do more. And this year is no exception to that. I can't wait for people to come and see the actual art installation here at the museum. So please make sure we do that. Uh, and working with the community and working with Hamilton has been so important to us. He, as a public artist, came to us with this idea and suggested that there was always a way to incorporate the community and incorporate public into art that we share and show and stories that we tell. And so we've had a great time working with him doing just that for our VA community makers in February. The first year we did it, it was Hamilton and he just, the two of us chatted about who the special honorees were and they were all well-deserving. And here we are four years later, we have a community panel that helped us do that. And I would say four years in now, we've worked with over 12 artists. We've highlighted 24 individuals and next year is our fifth anniversary. And we're really looking forward to having some fun with that. So um, stay tuned, enjoy this evening, enjoy our honorees and I will go away now. Well, let's turn it back over to Hamilton. Ham, can you share a little bit um, about why you even wanted to partner with uh, the museum to do such a project? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I'll speak for I'll speak for myself, but I know a lot of my peers too. I think uh, fine art museums in general in, in large cities can be intimidating places and spaces for people um, who might not understand the art or don't you know, you know, just think it's a space for them. And so as a public artist, my work revolves around community engagement and getting people involved. And so the more that I practice art and the more that I learned about it um, and seeing the VMFA as also a very engaging place, it just made sense to kind of bring, to bring those two together and find a way where people actually get to create art and take part of art in the museum. And I, and I think even when you hear that, it's a shocking concept because that's not usually how those things go. But um, I thought that approaching the VMFA with a project that highlighted people actually in the community would allow the, those people and their networks to kind of come together and, and learn about one another. So just another way of connecting people um, keeping that connection going through the community and also being able to use the museum and almost so you feel at home at the museum and not it not being just an intimidating place where art is, you know, for art. Now, and that was so, no, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in and say that was so on point because we are a state institution and we are here and open for everyone. And, you know, we're 365 days a year, free admission. We absolutely want people to see themselves here, be reflected in the stories. So Hamilton's idea was a, a wonderful way for us to do that. Um, and yes, we chose to do it in celebration of Black History Month, but there's, you can come any day of the, the year and there's always work by Black artists up in this museum on the wall. So I'm happy to say that. And this is just a special time. This year's theme though, which I was supposed to mention and I did not, <laughs> is, that, is that 
it's cultural luminaries. Mm -hmm. And it was inspired by our Man Ray exhibition that just closed on Monday. And he highlighted luminaries of Paris in the 1920s. So we want to highlight the luminaries of Richmond in the 2022. And we have a wonderful uh, list and group of people that we'll talk about this evening. So our cultural luminaries are here and they'll be on screen. And as I said, I encourage you to come see them in the atrium. Yeah, Paula. And one of the things that kind of you alluded to is that, you know, we didn't, art didn't stop. COVID didn't stop the art and it didn't stop this project. So Hamilton, can you talk just a little bit about like, you know, how the artwork continued and how you still illuminated these stories, although we were in some challenging times? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the big parts of RVA Community Makers beyond just the artwork that we have on display, the unveil artwork, is trying to get people to engage in work. And so that the first, I believe, two years um, pre, you know, pre COVID, we were able to have um, individuals come in and actually paint and, and, you know, get their hands dirty into that artwork that was that's going up. But this year, and uh, this year, we weren't able to do that because of COVID. But we did kind of ask a prompt question in which people could respond to. And those prompt questions, those answers to those prompt questions, ended up on the uh, title boards for the RVA community makers, as they always do um, in the years prior. So, you know, using what we can, you know, trying to navigate COVID to do that. Um, but whenever you see an RVA community makers project, please look out for the community engagement aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have artists that are a part of it. So Sandra Sellers did these amazing portraits for this year. Um, and people get to see those in, in, in real life in the, in the museum. Um, they are beautiful uh, yes. just looking at them as, as photos, but like when you go see them lit up in the atrium, they're even more amazing. So I urge people to go see those as well. So it's, you know, different mediums and different, um, uh, just different mediums that we use of art to, to seek that engagement. And I think that's really important, the important thing in this project. Yeah, and that leads right into me asking Sandra, like, what's your inspiration? Like, when, when, when you put that camera up to your eye, like, what's, what's the focus? You know, the inspiration is different for each session. And um, in the case of this, the people that we photographed this year, I knew everyone except two people. So I think the two people that I really didn't know, I, you know, just tried to research and find out about them. And um, so the inspiration changes. It, it can be music. It can be a poem. Um, and one of the instances, it was a book. One of the, um, one of the honorees had written something and it just, you know, it sparks something. So it just, it changes from session to session. I'm, I'm glad that you didn't give any names. And if you could do so right now. Oh, as well. Well. Wait, I know, I know. That's why, I, that's, that's why we all kind of was like, whoa. <laughs> Can you talk about any moments, any memories, especially with the people that you do know, you know, that you were able to have, you know, these, these per personal um, experiences with them. Any, any stories you'd like to share? Well, one of the one of the honorees, I've actually known the person most of my adult life. So being able to see how the person has grown in what they're doing is has been inspirational um, because I I knew the person when they were struggling, and you know it's just amazing to see. Thank you. Anything else you all want to share before we get into these honorees? Well, it, it was it was an honor photographing this group of people. Um, you know, everyone was willing to do it. Um, there was no hesitation from anybody. Everybody was, it was just a joy. It was a joy to do. 
All right. Well, are we ready to get into them? All right. I would like to introduce our first honoree. I know him personally. I have seen his artwork all around. You have seen his artwork all around. He is a legend in Richmond, S. Ross Brown. A professional studio artist with over 27 years of experience, S. Ross Brown has exhibited works in galleries and museums throughout the world. Many are in private, public, and institutional collections, including the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and the Valentine Museum. He is a recipient of the VMFA Fellowship, and his media credits include MSNBC's The Grio, The Huffington Post, Washingtonian, Ebony, Richmond Times Dispatch, Richmond Free Press, The Washington Post, and other outlets. Ross was the special, was the artist specialist for the VCU health system, practicing art therapy and teaching art to patients. He was an art educator for various support groups, including Living Well for Pediatric Cancer Support and the Richmond Brain Tumor Support Group. Brown was an instructor for the resident associate program at the Smithsonian Institute and has taught art and design to inner city and at risk youth for the Fresh Air Fund of New York City, Weed and Seed, Project Ready, and Art 180. As an illustrator, he has worked for Macmillan Publishing, the McDonald's Corporation, Pulp Literature Press of Canada, Jarcadia Books of London, and the University of Virginia Press. Brown studied at Virginia Commonwealth University and the Corran School of Arts in Washington, DC, and is an alumnus of the Miller School of Albemarle. Let's welcome F. Ross Brown to the stage. Hello. Hey, Ross. Hey, how are you? I am great. Good to see you. And what an honor for you to be on this platform. I hope I didn't murder anything in your bio too, too bad. No, no, it sounded great. I, I saw some images going by, but I didn't know if everyone else was seeing them. I don't know how this stuff works. But great I, images um, of your work. So tell us how you feel, Ross. How's it feel to be honored um, in your community? Uh, you know, seeing all the other luminaries that are uh, here, I'm like, am I worthy? What is going on here? You of course know? you are. And so I am extremely honored, uh, very uh, uh, humble to be among such uh, people, you know, especially, you know, the rest of the people, you know, when you start reading their biographies, you be like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> You're not giving yourself enough credit. You have been a, a legend artist in this community for as long as I've been here. So thank you, Ross, uh, for all that you were doing. And we are continuing to see um, the projects that you got coming up next. I really, I, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate this honor. And I hope that I can do more uh, in the present and future to live up to Thanks, Ross. All right. And we're going to our next honoree. James Gordon. James is an educational champion for children, teachers, and communities. Gordon is the principal of Oak Grove Be Bellmead Elementary in Richmond. He was recently named a Disney Magic Maker honoree for his contributions to his students and community. Gordon aspired to, be, to become an educator since he was a child and credits his mother for motivating him to pursue his passion. A graduate of Highland Springs High School, James Madison University, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Gordon is pursuing, pursuing his doctorate at Regent University. He's happily married to Nakisha Gordon and the father of Leilani, Olivia, and Ali. Let's welcome James to the platform. Hey, James. Hello, How are you doing, Kelly? What's going on, champions? I feel like I know you, James. I feel like I know you because I know all of the work that you're doing um, with RPS. And, you know, we have some mutual friends that that, that share your, yeah. your, your praise. But congratulations. And, and um, please tell us how it feels to receive this award and also, you know, just to get these flowers for being able to educate our youth. Listen, thank you again. Thank you so much. And congratulations to all the other honorees. Uh, I am truly humbled, honored, grateful. 
thankful, appreciative, and all those other great words to describe how I feel. This is, again, for every teacher, every student. This is for the struggle. This is for everyone who is a dreamer and who is a believer in their hopes and aspirations. And so um, as my mom would share from Langston Hughes, life hasn't been a crystal stair, but we're still moving forward. And that's what it's about. So it's for Oak Grove, Bellamy Elementary School, uh, all of our students, faculty, and staff there. I love our community, Hillside, Afton, uh, James River Bell, Jefferson Trace. So this is just for you all. So thank you. Thank you so much for the honor. And I'm very appreciative. I love it, James. Way to share it with all of those that make it happen for you. Congratulations to you. We are so excited to see your students soar. So thank you. All right, we are moving to our next honoree. Dr. Julian Hader is a historian and associate professor of leadership studies at the University of Richmond. His research focuses on modern US history, African-American history, and the American civil rights movement. He is the author of The Dream is Lost, Voting Rights in the Politics of Race in Richmond, Virginia. His work has been published in the Journal of Pol Policy History, The Washington Post, New American History, and other national publications. He's also regularly contributes to national and local media outlets. Dr. Hayter, welcome and congratulations to you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm honored. Yeah, I'm, I love everything about you. I love your energy. I love how that you hold no bars. Tell us what this means to get this honor um, in your community and doing the work, and more importantly, doing the work that you're doing. I, well, I think, you know, in, in the spirit of what Hamilton was saying earlier, I think this is yet another example of um, how fine arts museums are reimagining the canon. And, uh, you know, historians in some ways are doing much of the same thing. Um, for any number of reasons, we're no longer working in the shadows. I think we're at a critical moment where we all realize now that history matters. So in some ways, I'm here as an honoree in the spirit of the people um, whose history is finally being told. So I consider myself a vehicle in some ways for um, the ancestors, if you will. And so this, this honor is in some ways um, in honor of them. Yeah, I can't wait to connect with you more as we keep telling these untold stories of Richmond and untelling, I mean, some of these stories as well, like getting the truth out there. You are a champion and I am so honored that you are getting your flowers in that way. So congratulations Thank you to much. you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Good to be yeah. here. And moving on to the next. This is a double one, but we're going to do them one at a time. Congratulations to the Moon Sisters, which, you know, I am excited to do this one. First up is Anjali Moon. She's the executive director of the Africana Institute, as well as assistant curator of film and special programs with the Institute of Contemporary Art at Virginia Commonwealth University. She is the creative director of the Africana Independent Film Festival and deputy director of the Jackson Project. She is also the founding chair of BLK RVA or Black RVA, a Richmond Region Tourism Initiative designed to connect Richmond residents and visitors with Black-owned businesses in the area. She um, and her work has been featured in Style Weekly, The Huffington Post, BET, Essence, Black Enterprise, Travel Noir, The Root, Virginia Currents on PBS, and she was recently recognized by Virginia Business Magazine as one of the people to meet in 2021 and 2022. I'm naming that. And has received a VCIC Humanitarian Award as well as a Richmond Times Dispatch Strong Voices Award. She's also a recipient of Style Weekly's Women in the Arts Award and Top 40 Under 40. However, her greatest accomplishment is being the mother to Jonah, her son, who's an artist and an inspiring filmmaker at Emerson College. Let's welcome Anjali to the stage. All right, Anjali, before you get to talking, I'm going to run down Dr. Cisha Joy who is an executive director of the Jackson Project and the chief diversity officer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology with the US Department of Commerce, where, has, where she's received the US Patent and Trademark Office Bronze Award for superior performance. Um, 
the Commerce Spirit Award and Spotlight on Commerce for the LGBTQ Plus Pride Month. She's a senior fellow, fellow of the Excellence in Government Fellowship with the Partnership for Public Service and senior research fellow with the Conference Board's Engagement Institute. In addition to recently completing an executive education program with the Harvard Business School, she received, she received her MS from the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs and a BA in Black Studies from Virginia Commonwealth University, as well as her PhD in Public Administration and Urban Policy from Old Dominion University. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, as well as a board member with St. Luke's 5K Walk Run in D.C. in Virginia, and Virginia Criminal Justice Board, excuse me. She lives in Northern Virginia with her wife, Janice Pritchard, and Cockapoo Benji. In her heart, when I say her heart is forever in Richmond. Let's welcome Dr. Cisha Joy to the platform as well. Congratulations, Moon Sisters. You know, I can give y'all flowers all day. How's it feel? How's it feel? I'll let Big Sis go first. Well, I mean, I'll just say for me, much of what other people have said, um, I'm humbled, it's, it's an honor. Uh, I've had the good fortune to receive this uh, accolade twice. Um, I was part of the first group. And so to be recognized again, when there's so much amazing work happening in Richmond, there's so many people pouring into the shift that's happening in our city in real time. So I am humbled. I am thankful and very, um, I don't know, feel the responsibility. Uh, Julian spoke of doing this uh, in honor of the ancestors. We don't stand here in a vacuum. Um, none of this work that I've done is in a vacuum. So I'm thankful to be able to be here and to be able to do this alongside my sister uh, means so much. So. Thank you. Um, I echo, um, I'm kind of blown away to receive this honor, not only to hold space with those who are past honorees, this year's honorees, but then who will be future honorees because of all of the incredible work happening. You know, to know us is to know we're two little black girls from Bird Park, um, growing up and navigating Richmond, just to be honest, you know, this is a stretch of the boulevard that we avoided. Um, for real reasons. Um, and so to hear Hamilton talk about uh, creating spaces where you belong, to be able to take up space in this moment while holding space for the ancestors. And, and you know, we agree with um, Dr. Hader, you know, we are vessels. And I think for Anjali and myself, when we look at Jackson Project, our, then our lens of community is really connecting the people of the present to the people of the past. Um, through a historical lens. And so, you know, to hold space in this moment as an art museum, when the truth is Jackson Ward, which is the crux of our work, um, it's a work of art in itself. Um, we really spend time with, with, you know, its origin story. So it's an honor. It is. It's so, so dope to, to see y'all be from Richmond and the work that y'all, I mean, y'all are literally putting Richmond on your map. I mean, on your back and saying, you're going to respect this city. And so like, um, we're going to be throwing roses at y'all for probably the next 20, 30, 40 years for the work that y'all are doing. And I'm so excited about it. So congratulations, Moon Sisters. We appreciate you, you so and everyone. Thank you. All right. Our next honoree tonight is Valerie Cassell Oliver. Valerie Cassell Oliver is the Sydney and Francis Lewis family curator of modern and contemporary art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. She joined BMFA in 2017, leaving behind a stellar professional career in Houston, where she served as senior curator from 2000 to 2017. During her tenure at BMFA, Valerie has organized several exhibitions, including Howard Dina Pinnell, What Remains to be Seen with Naomi Beckwith in 2018, which was named one of the most influential exhibitions of the decade. The Cosmologies of the Tree of Life, 2019. Valerie, you're gonna correct me when I, if I messed any of this up. And in 2021, she organized the critically acclaimed exhibition, The Dirty South, Contemporary Art, Material, Culture, and the Sonic Impulse, which was named one of the best exhibitions in 2021 by the New York Times and Art in America. Valerie's also the recipient of the Getty Curatorial Research Fellowship, a fellowship from the Center of Curatorial, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, Leadership, the David C. Driscoll Award, and the Arthur, excuse me, and the Arthur and Carol Kuffman Goldberg Foundation to Life Fellowship. 
and the James A. Porter Book Award from 2016 to 2017. She was a senior fellow in the tutorial studies at the School of Art Institute in Chicago and in 2020 served with Hamza Waller as the senior fellow for viewpoints at the University of Texas in Austin. She also holds an executive MBA from Columbia University and an MA in art history from Howard University and a BS in communications from the University of Texas at Austin. Let's welcome Valerie to the platform. Thank you, Kelly. You know I was nervous, Valerie, because <laughs> oh, all praises do. I am in your house. How does it feel to be recognized by your own, Valerie? Well, I mean, it, uh, it's very humbling and uh, I will just be yet another echo uh, within the space to say that, that this is a deep honor, you know, and uh, concentric circles of community are always just, um, they, they, they affirm that uh, you are doing what it is that you, you purport to do. And, and that's, you know, this work has always been my North Star and uh, it is deeply humbling uh, to know that there's recognition uh, for just getting down and doing the work. That's as simple as it is. And um, it is idea of community. I mean, it is about a sense of belonging and that's what I hope to create at the museum is to have people who walk in there to feel that they belong in that museum. And so um, I'm deeply grateful that I get to do this every day and, uh, and humble that I get to be recognized for doing it. Well, Valerie, we hope again that you continue to put the spotlight on Richmond through the work that you're doing here for years to come. We hope that you are so in love with Richmond that you'll never, ever, ever, ever leave us and you'll continue to bring this great artwork to our city. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, thank you so much, dear. Yes. All right. And our next honoree, this is one of another one of my favorites on here, Michael Paul Williams. Michael Paul Williams is a Metro columnist whose opinion pieces appear on the op-ed page of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. He was awarded the 2021 Pulitzer Prize for, contempor for commentary for penetrating and historically insightful columns that guided Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy, Confederacy through the painful and complicated process of dismantling the city's monuments to white supremacy. Williams has also been recognized four times by the Virginia Press Association for column writing. He was awarded the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University. He received the George Mason Award for Outstanding Contributions to Virginia Journalism, given by the Virginia Pro Chapter of the Society for Professional Journalists. A humanitarian, a humanitarian Award for the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities and the Will Rogers Humanitarian Award from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. A Richmond native, he's a graduate of Virginia Union University and of Northwestern University um, Medell School of Journalism. He also was named Richmonder of the Year in 2021. I have to just welcome my colleague to the stage, Michael Paul Williams. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's an honor to be here tonight. Michael Paul, um, you, you know, I, I am with you all the time now as I am, you know, not only getting to see your work, but sharing a podcast stage with you. And again, you winning the Pulitzer and putting Richmond on the map by talking about these monuments coming down um, and all the other things that you've been writing about for years. Can we talk um, a little bit about how you being recognized by your community means to you tonight? Well, I mean, first off, it's the company here tonight, um, the fellow honorees. Um, um, some of whom are, you know, like yourself, um, I, I, I collaborate with, um, uh, I depend on um, for their expertise. Uh, I share their roots um, when it comes to the Moon Sisters as far as West End. Um, it's, it's, we use the term luminaries and for so long, Richmond chased its black luminaries out of Richmond. And it is such a blessing that Richmond is now availing itself of their talents and the city is much better for it. And um, I think the museum is a reflection of that. Um, the museum historically has not been a welcoming place for us, but the transformation that the museum has undergone in, in recent years, um, thanks to 
folks like Valerie and, 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 and Monroe Harris, um, reflects, I think, the growth of Richmond and becoming a more um, inclusive and dynamic place. So just the idea of, of uh, my photo hanging in what has to be one of my favorite spots in Richmond just really gives me a charge. So yeah. it, it's just, I just feel tremendous. I am so glad you're getting your flowers. I'm so glad that we, you know, are not only giving them to you in, in an artistic form, but that people are really, really starting to hear your voice. So a little plug, his podcast starts on March 8th. So make sure you tune in. It's called After the Monuments. Congratulations to you again, Michael Paul. Thank you, Kelly. Yes. All right. Now that we have met all of our honorees, let's take some time to look at a quick slideshow and presentation honoring them once again. Okay. All right, I think we're bringing everyone in. All right. As we're welcoming everybody back to the stage, amazing, amazing photos. And um, if we could ask all of the panelists um, when you come back on, if you could make sure that you um, stay on mute, but we're going to turn your videos on so we can see everybody. Just so excited to. These photos are amazing as we are getting, I mean, just this is celebrating I mean my, my heart is so black and so full right now y'all look amazing so we're going to get some conversation started while we are um getting, there we go all right there's everybody hey y'all all right so let's just talk. We're gonna have a casual conversation. And um, once again, congratulations to all of you all. Um, let me turn the camera um, so now you can officially see um, kind of where it's set up right here in the museum. It is lit up. I mean, y'all are gonna cry, smile. I see a lot of your family members on here. Um, y'all sons, your daughters, your wives, your husband, everybody should be proud of what you um, are displaying right here. Sandra, your work is amazing. Ham, your work is amazing if any of you all want to share or reflect on how you're feeling right now i just honestly want to say thank you again to the vmfa for continuing this project they, they really i mean i i thought of it but they really are the the heart and and what makes this continue to grow and and also um hats off to paula uh paula sailor robertson who um, I get to work with every year behind this project. Um, she is also uh, has continued to push it and try to move the needle every time. And so um, I just want to I just want to thank everyone involved. It's it's always amazing to learn about 
um, what everyone is doing in Richmond. You think you know someone because you hear their name and you see their work, but then when you really get to, you know, when we first always come together in the in the, the end of the year and start talking about what RVA community makers looks like for the next year, um, you re I, re I get to research and dig deep into what, what everyone is doing. And I'm almost always blown away. I'm always blown away by the amazing work that, ha that happens. And so my, it's just my hope that people also see these, even if they didn't learn, you know, even if they know or have seen someone that they heard of, dig deeper into their work and what they do. And maybe they could, their work can help you in some type of way, I'm sure. We all inspire to do other things, but the idea behind this is to kind of connect, learn, and then reach out um, because that is the only way that we're going to move further. So these there there are so many different RVA worthy RVA community makers here in Richmond, um, and not having a big enough wall, even in the VMFA, uh, is always a hard thing in trying to pick who who's there. So just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has made this you know, become a larger project every year. And I just continue, I just hope to continue to see it grow. Yeah. Yeah. Have any of you all worked on other projects together? Any other, you know, connections? I, I know one, but is there any other projects that the audience needs to know about that y'all have already done? Well, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've worked with Hamilton Glass with Mending Walls. I'm a board member for the Africana Film Festival and you know, was the, uh, I guess, the bouncer offer of the idea for uh, the Africana Film Festival. Um, I, I, you know, I am a professional colleague with uh, Valerie. I, I know a lot of these people, and I'm pretty sure that when she said she knew somebody when they were struggling, Sandra was probably talking about me. I don't know if she's going to admit that or not. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Anybody else? You might not know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as Ross said, I've known Ross for many years and he's been very helpful in Africana uh, from the evolution of our logo, bouncing off of ideas. He's an active board member. Uh, Ham, I've had the pleasure of working with Ham actually in 2019. Um, he uh, helped he, alongside Ross and, and many other artists in the community, came together to create a pop-up mural that Africana did called Her Flowers uh, that was designed to uh, be a space of remembrance for the women who had lost their lives to police brutality um, kind of over the history of, of, of the United States. And so very thankful for that. Julian has been amazing in terms of a partner with Jackson Project, Michael Paul Williams, can't say enough. Valerie, Paula, VMFA, like, Everybody, Kelly, like it's it's a family. Sandra, James, you fitting to get in here in just a second. Don't you worry. You you Listen. won't get away. Okay. But no, it's 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 wonderful to see so many people. I just want to thank Hamilton and Paula um, for continuing this work, keeping it going. You know, yes, there's the idea, but then there's the growth of a thing. And so to see the level of dedication uh, that's happened uh, over the last four years has been amazing. So thank you. Yeah. And if I can say one thing, I know that you said professionally, but then personally, like if we could just hold, we think about art, a lot of the people on the line, some of my first interactions were through Versus, Tuesday Versus on 2nd Street, Tropical Soul, Lorna Pinkney. Um, and so just want to hold space for her in this moment, because some of those personal relationships and we think about community, they have helped to fortify the professional work that we're doing today. Great. I love it. Like, it, I mean, Lee, you said it, family. Like, you know, I, I know there's another 79 people on this call, but are they though? Like, because, I mean, we really, I mean, we could probably talk for hours about different things that we could, you know, collab and do together. So um, I'm just just so glad that you guys are, um, are being celebrated. Um, anybody else want to talk about collaborations before I get into another question? And if there's any questions from the audience, uh, Paula is going to uh, feed those to us. Um, unfortunately, Paula, I don't know if I could see it on the chat as quickly as you may be able to. Well, Kelly, if I, if I could pipe up, I mean, just um, my tenure here being in Richmond is almost five years. And I will say that I've been welcomed with open arms. And that says not only that there's family uh, here, but there is a desire to continuously expand 
and embrace uh, new members uh, into that family. So I'm eternally grateful that I've been welcomed with open arms and um, to continue the work and, and uh, to push it even further as much as I can. Colleagues, both within and outside of the institution, it really does feel uh, like we are all moving in the right direction together, pulling yeah. with one another. And that makes all the difference in the world, as you know. And I wanted to say that I've had the opportunity to photograph everybody here before. Um, and it's, it's just been amazing to see everybody grow. All right, I got, I got another question if y'all are ready to answer it. What is your favorite thing about Richmond? And I want you to, uh, you don't give me the cookie cutter, you know, again, family, don't, you know, we, <laughs> what's your favorite thing about Richmond? Uh, I would like to say that we might have to cookie cutter it up because I think it's, uh, for me, it's the people that in turn become family. I know I said something, like I said, a professional colleague about it, but I know we're son Geo. I know most of these people's children. You know, we, 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 and we engage with one another. And once you meet them, you become family and you know them for years and you care about them and you love them. And I think it's the evolution of relationships that you get from the people in Richmond because it's so genuine. And the, the, that it's not too big and not too small. You get to the river in no time, you get to the country, to the city, it's all good. You know, and the, the history and the, uh, uh, the restaurants, the art, a lot of things, you know, so cohesively, I think it, it becomes uh, it's a, a wonderful place to live. Anybody can jump in or not. Well, no, I would agree with that. I, um, I think, Rich, I mean, to piggyback off what Ross said about the, the, the size of Richmond being perfect and its location. I've said this before, but this is what I love about Richmond. It's location being right in between like the North and the South. Technically this is the South, but that, and I, um, I just feel like we get the best of both worlds and all of the amazing things that happen here um, are usually done by people like us. And what I mean by that is like just regular everyday people who are just passionate about about something and um and being from philadelphia it was i think it's a little bit different there right we we as and i say we as i used to be a philadelphian lean on the city to do more of those things as we're here it, it just seems like everything is just run by passionate people right we we make our own stories we make um and, and our voices are heard loud here and i, I just really appreciate that about richmond and it, feel, and it just feels like if you want to do something here, you can do it. And you will find enough passionate people who, can, who, will, who will jump behind you or beside you and make it happen. And so that's what I love best about Richmond. I would um, say that um, my favorite things about Richmond, well, obviously it's home. Um, and that entails family, um, both immediate family and extended family. But um, just as a professional, it is a fascinating place um, to be a journalist. I think um, you can't really understand America if you don't understand Richmond. And the evolution of Richmond, I think, um, can have a lot of lessons for America. So it's, it's, and it's like a laboratory. It's small enough where change can happen in a minute. It's, it's not that big ship that takes a long time to turn around. And for so long, it was resistant to change. So it's really gratifying to see that it's finally in a space where change seems possible. I, I would gonna... agree with that too. Sorry, Kelly, I would agree with that. I mean, I think coming out of Houston, being from Houston originally, which is a fairly recent city compared to most cities in the mid-Atlantic and uh, Williamsburg, uh, for instance, you know, uh, the history here is so rich. Uh, and the fact that it is a city that is at a point of evolution, it's evolving, and it's dynamic in its evolution in this moment. It's just really, um, 
it's it's amazing to to bear witness to it, to be in the midst of it, to be a part of the change and a part of the dynamism. Um, that is it, that does not happen every day, and I don't think any of us should take that for granted. That you could be a part of the change um, that you want to have uh, in in the place where you live, that you can actually participate in that. Um, yeah. so that that is I, a amazing part of the city, truly. I agree. I, I did my graduate work at UVA and I was told when I was at UVA that Richmond was not hospitable to outsiders and I, and I am not a native Richmonder. And I, 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 when I, you know, when I started doing research here, and when I moved here, I found that that wasn't the case. And I think it's really interesting, if you know anything about Richmond's history, that it was like the second biggest slave trading hub in the United States. So there are so many African-Americans whose lives are implicated in this city. Um, some of them native Richmond, there's others who have moved, were, were moved forcibly to points beyond. And I think in some ways that story's come full circle, right? Where Richmond is now, right? There, there are all these people coming back to this space for all the reasons that everyone delineated just a second ago. And it's becoming this point of diamondism um, in a manner that's moving beyond this kind of tortured history and people are reclaiming the past in a way um, that, as Mike said, that really reflects a, an American story. And it's it's quite fascinating what's happening here right now. There's a renaissance, people like to talk about restaurants in Richmond. I think there's, a, there's another renaissance taking place in Richmond right now that I think the rest of the country would do well to, to take, a, uh, take a hard and fast look at. Oh, can I please chime in on that? You I was know, hoping. I, you know, I don't live in Richmond currently born and raised but I live in Northern Virginia but if you meet me I promise you after I say my name is Cisha Joy Moon the next two words that come out of my mouth is I'm black and I'm from Richmond and I think that's very important because I think that you know all of us might not stay in Richmond forever but what is our responsibility to take Richmond and Brooms with us as we transcend that space and I think that um, yes, I'm an academic by trade, but I think that it's important to say it's important to be Black and from Richmond because I've walked away with, for all of the degrees and letters behind my name, my Blackness is informed by Sundays in Bird Park riding with the windows down. It's informed by, uh, you know, June Jubilee um, or Ivories or Bojangles or the original Croker Spot, you know, really finding a way to juxtapose all that I've learned versus all that has informed who I am. And so I walk away with this level of fondness when I walk into rooms, so when I say I'm Black and I'm from Richmond, I carry it deep down and kind of said this earlier, Kelly, I carry that like tenfold on my chest. It is a level of pride. Um, in a space where you would think that blackness might not have been a prideful thing to say. Um, and so I, I, I wanna make sure we say I'm, I'm black and I'm from Richmond. Both are important. I mean, I think most people have said it. Uh, for me, I love the evolutionary process that Richmond is in right now, understanding where we come from, uh, understanding that the black American story really does begin here and that we're at a place where we are uh, expanding the definition of what that means and bringing a level of light to Richmond and its importance in that story and that journey um, is really exciting. So to be alive and in Richmond right now is pretty remarkable and amazing. Um, also, just to kind of speak to its size and that kind of familial energy that we spoke about earlier, it's a level of accessibility in Richmond that I think is hard in other places. Uh, what, while Julian was saying, you know, people were saying, oh, if you're not in the Richmond, if you're not from Richmond, you can't get in, but you can get in. Richmond is very fertile ground. So those ideas that people have, like what Hamilton has brought to a VMFA, you know how hard this would be if you were in New York trying to get this in a state institution in, in New York City. And so I'm excited to be in a place that's just as relevant as New York, just as relevant as Atlanta or Philadelphia um, and growing in its relevance but also accessible to the regular everyday folk, you know, that might not have been born in a particular group, may not have all those letters behind their names, may not have a ton of money, but they do have the passion and they have the ideas. And so um, it's exciting to be in a place that will embrace that and that that'd be enough. Any last thoughts on that comment before I move on to, an, uh, we do have another question. No? All right. Um, how do you share your love of art? And what are we saying to the next generation? Um, I'll chime in on that one. So um, as an elementary school principal, as an educator, talking with our students about music, 
Um, each morning uh, at Oak Grove Bellamy Elementary School, if you were to come in, we are playing music as soon as you walk into our building. Um, I've been serving as a principal there for, this is my fourth year, and so we started up within my first year there. And so you're going to hear some smooth jazz, you're going to hear some R&B, some hip hop, depending upon what's going on, some Stevie Wonder. Um, and so I'm super grateful that we are reiterating the importance of the arts with our students. Um, actually, on our fourth grade hallway, we have one of our uh, Latino students. His name is Paul. He drew beautiful art pictures uh, for the bulletin board. So uh, you have Harriet Tubman, you have Dr. King and other historical black figures for the fourth grade bulletin board that this student, this Latino student on his own created. And so we're displaying his work. And so for us, as you know, we talk about expressing yourself. So obviously our students, they can see, okay, so Mr. Gordon, you have like long hair, you have locks. And so I talk to the students about, I call it hair love. So listen, I like your hair love. I see the style you have going on. So trying to promote our students to embrace their individuality uh, while also the sense of community. So that's how we try to do it there. I think there's, um, you know, the harking back to the, the kind of Renaissance. I've said this before, I, you know, People have lived and died on this for believing in things that are patently false, that we know are patently false. And we will, in some ways, die believing in things that future actors know are patently false. But we're at this kind of Copernican moment now where this, where people are pushing against the status quo. There's a thought evolution taking place in this city. I think that future actors that grow up in this city um, will know a much richer version of, of the city story that has ever been told. And, and to me, that's a source of deep pride. Um, and I know that people have been, have dedicated their lives artistically, historically, um, in media outlets, in, in public schools and, 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 and school systems to make sure that future actors inherit something um, much more valuable um, and, and much more meaningful than what has historically been provided to vulnerable communities in the city of Richmond. I think this is a, it's a wonderful time to be alive um, right now. I think there's some really profound things happening. And it's like, I meant what I said when I said the VMFA is reimagining the canon, but that goes beyond. It's, re it's resonating beyond the art community and into institutions and organizations that are really pushing this city forward in unimaginable ways. Right. Doc, has anybody put beats behind your speeches? Because <laughs> I promise you, if you put a couple of hard beats behind what you're saying, yo, and 16 bars, I will listen to you all day. I was born in 1975. I'm first generation hippo. I don't know how to speak in anything other than the black vernacular tradition. Like, but, that, yeah, right? but that speaks to the next generation. And I just applaud you again, just for keeping it real, like a dope beat behind you would have me all day. But anyway. <laughs> Kelly, I, I would love to, I, I, I won't, uh, I can't, uh, I can't uh, compete with Julian on that tip, but I will say that you know, my job is to just preserve those stories, preserve the moment, you know, bring those narratives into the museum so that for future generations, people will know that, that, that their stories, their creative stories have been, been a part of this from the beginning. Um, and uh, to have that in perpetuity for the future, that, that I think signals and, and what you can break down in terms of, uh, uh, breaking down the misperceptions of who people are through art. You can really allow people to see. And once you see something, you don't ever unsee it. It changes you. And that is what is supposed to happen. And that's, you know, I will applaud the, the you know, leaders of the museum, Alex Nargis and Michael Taylor for really making, you know, opening the doors, you know, uh, Dr. Monroe Harris and all of the chairs who have come before, you know, the board to really being on one accord. It's one thing to come in as a curator and try to make change, but it's hard to do that when the administration and the board is not amenable to that. So it, it is a straight line to evolution at the institution. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, I um, uh, express my appreciation of our, I guess, by creating it, collecting it, uh, teaching it, and immersing myself in it and what Richmond has to offer by helping to inspire what I do. But I think most importantly is to share with everyone that 
art is a part of their daily lives, whether they realize it or not. And that it is not just gerrymandered to those who create art without those who appreciate it, without those who, who you know, uh, use it to express themselves. It's, you know, it, it's not something that's created in a vacuum. And I think that, you know, trying to share the fact that everyone and anyone, you know, can live a profoundly more fulfilling life if they immerse it in art and understand what with art, not just paintings and drawings and film and whatnot, music, but every aspect from what you wear to what you eat to how you perceive the world, you know, will enrich your existence. And I think that uh, Richmond being so steeped in history, but also in its nascency, uh, helps to make that a very uh, fertile and fecund environment. Um, go ahead, Anjali. Um, I just feel like I can trace the turning point um, in what I perceive to be the turning point in Richmond to the emergence of the arts community as a driving force. Um, when we had an Africana Film Festival, when I saw the murals pop up, when Hamilton Glass came to our newspaper to give a presentation and I walked away with a piece of his art. Um, when I saw my wife working with the literary community, with the James River writers and, and with um, screenwriting um, group and, and, and working actively to diversify it and, and having a front row seat seeing all that. Uh, just, I feel like just so much of what has, is positive about, about the town has been driven by um, the people who work in the arts. And um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, I'll just say, you know, you know, Valerie mentioned storytelling. And I think at the root of the work that, you know, I've been able to do, uh, even before I stepped into the quote unquote art space in my time at Croker Spot, uh, there were stories being told, stories through the food, stories through the space, uh, and yes, through the art that hung on the wall, and then stepping into Africana, uh, creating like a very deliberate platform uh, for people who decided to capture stories through the digital space uh, and to be able to share that particular medium. And I think, you know, when I think about future generations, one of the beautiful things about now is going back to the idea of accessibility. You know, sometimes art has felt like something that if you can't paint, if you can't draw or sing, then art's not for you. And I'm certain I can't paint, draw, I can't do any of that. Right. But understanding that, you know, we now have all these mediums and we have platforms like the Internet that in introduces to those mediums. I think that level of access and the younger generation is getting to see like the multitude of ways to approach art, whether it be as a connoisseur or whether it be as a creator, um, I think is the key for future generations. You know, it's not something that's like limited to an art classroom. The entire world is an artistic expression of some sort. And so helping them to understand that and giving them easy access to it through the way that we talk, as you spoke about Julian, uh, you know, the way that we dress, like all of it matters. And so people seeing true reflections of themselves, um, like with your hair love, um, I think makes all the difference. And so I think that's the sort of thing that will inspire and inform future generations regarding art. And I'm going to let Anjali put the pin in it because unfortunately we have to wrap up this conversation um, unless there was one last thing that um, needed to be said for the good of the cause. But I, 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 we got our cue that we got to start wrapping things up. And um, I, will, I will go ahead and say you can find the Michael Williams podcast available March 8th at Richmond.com and available wherever you hear podcasts. Okay. It's called After the Monuments, a real talk about race with Michael Paul Williams and Kelly Levin. Okay, here we go. Here's our, our last glance at our honorees. And because we want to make sure that uh, they are going to get something special as well, we want to show you um, their gift. And um, each of our honorees is going to receive um, a portrait of themselves from Sandra. So congratulations once again to S. Ross Brown, James A. Gordon III, Dr. Julian Hader, 
the Moon Sisters, Dr. Cesar Joy and Anjali, Valerie Cassell Oliver, and Michael Paul Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And All I right. just want to remind everyone to please come on into the museum, see the artwork live in person, seven feet tall and all lit up, which everybody on the screen deserves. Yes. Wonderful. It is going to be here until March 14th, um, but it will go to the Black History Museum. Um, I, can, I, I can say that, correct, Paula? The next location after it leaves here? Yes, yes. Okay. Wanted to make sure, but please come see it here, uh, free admission. And of course the museum is open 365 days a year. There's always black art here. So you do not have to just come in February to see it. Please make sure that you come. Thank you once again to Chase as well for being a sponsor. Chase, thank you so, so, so much. Um, and then there's also some other things that are still happening in the museum. And we wanna make sure that you are taking advantage of that. Traveling to the Black History Museum, um, I'm sorry, we, I talked about that the, the, the art is leaving here and traveling to the Black History Museum. Um, tomorrow night at six o'clock, there's another Black History program, African-American Read-In, where Black literature and Black art are paired together for your enjoyment and engagement. And you can hear Principal Gordon um, read his poem um, that's connected um, to a, a selected piece. Plus, my little brother is is going to be speaking tomorrow or reading tomorrow as well, as long as friends, Anna Edwards and my business partner, Melody Short will be reading too. Thank you once again for tuning in for tonight's Community Makers. It was a joy to be a host. I am so glad that um, VMFA is doing this program to give these Richmonders their flowers. We'll see you guys next year or later on this year when you come visit VMFA. Thank you guys, good night. <laughs>